Hello, my name is Brian Taroha. I'm a researcher at the University of California, Irvine. Thank you for having me in the Applied Energy Symposium. And today I will be talking to you about exploring the role of flexible geothermal electricity resources in developing cost-effective decarbonized electricity grids. This work was also done in conjunction with a colleague from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Gregory Rhodes. And so with that, let's get into the presentation. So a little bit of background and the research questions that this project is set to answer. Before I start, I just want to make it clear that this is an ongoing project, which means that the results are not finalized or completed. But what we'll show today is sort of what we're finding right now. And this has the potential to evolve as it goes along. But first, let's look at the scope. These are the three research questions. And the first research question is, what is the value of enabling geothermal power plants to operate flexibly and better facilitating a near zero carbon electricity system? The reason why we're asking this question is that there are a lot of grid planning studies for how to develop zero carbon electricity systems. And many of them find that in order to do so at lowest cost, it's good to retain some capacity of controllable zero carbon resources, whether that's geothermal or hydropower, or in some cases, nuclear, in order to limit the amount of energy storage that you might need to fully decarbonize the electricity system. Preferably, these controllable zero carbon resources can op will be able to operate flexibly to follow the variability of wind and solar, which will dominate the bulk of the electricity mix in developing zero carbon electricity systems. So this first question is we wanna focus on this aspect for geothermal, where we're asking if you have geothermal in the system, is it, what value does it provide if you operate it flexibly versus not operating it flexibly, right? Then that leads us to the second research question, which is what are the implications of harnessing the system-wide value of flexible geothermal operation for costs burdened by geothermal power plant operators? Now, currently, geothermal power plants operate fairly steady. They also usually have contracted prices. So there is not an economic incentive for these geothermal power plants to operate flexibly, even though technically they are capable of doing so. Because if you start operating it flexibly or turning it down and ramping it up, they will reduce their capacity factor, potentially incur some additional degradation, and that will reduce their revenue, right? Their net revenue which means that the price at which they'll have to sell electricity will have to go up. So we'll, have, we'll look at how much that impact occurs when you're operating it flexibly. And this all sums up in the third research question, which is, is it more valuable for geothermal resources to provide bulk energy or flexible generation when it's supporting a zero carbon electricity system? So that's the scope, and this is our approach. Here's a schematic of our approach. The four major steps go as follows. First, we're going to characterize the configuration of the grid and the parameters that define geothermal flexibility. Then we'll simulate grids with increasingly flexible geothermal operation. Then we will compare the results of these simulations in terms of the effect of flexible geothermal on system-wide costs and also the cost or the price at which geothermal electricity has to be sold at. And then we can determine the value of geothermal for the electricity system. So a little bit more detail on some of those steps. First, well, we are looking at a future grid scenario in California where the installed zero carbon generation capacity is sufficient to meet a zero or near zero, in this case, carbon electricity system. The study focuses on California and takes into account temporal load balancing dynamics. And then within that future grid mix, we're going to simulate the dispatch of the electric grid with increasing geothermal turndown ranges. Now we're focusing on geothermal turndown range where zero turndown means it operates flat at its full capacity for the whole year. And 100% turndown means it's allowed to turn down all the way down to 100% if there is going to be excess generation on the system. And we'll do that in increments of 10%. And also sensitivities to varying levels of renewable energy, of variable renewable energy penetration, energy storage, and install geothermal capacity, right? For each of these combinations of parameters, we will determine which configurations comply with a given zero carbon penetration target for California. In these results, we will be looking at 
the goal of California Senate Bill 100, which is to provide 100% of retail sales of electricity in the state to be met with zero carbon resources by 2045. Now, this doesn't necessarily translate to 100% of generation because the reason why I highlighted retail sales of electricity is the fact that generation that goes into overcoming losses in the system doesn't, does not necessarily need to be zero carbon under this policy goal. Um, so that this translates to about 88% of total generation being zero carbon for 100% of retail sales of electricity being zero carbon. So while complying with a given zero carbon electricity penetration goal, we will determine how increasing geothermal turndown ranges affects the cost associated with meeting that goal. Our representative grid scenario is we take the grid configuration from the California Senate Bill 100 Joint Agency Report, and this specifies the grid resource mix and demands to meet to have compliance with the year 2045 SB 100 goal based on capacity expansion modeling using what they call the study scenario. And then we'll do some sensitivities on that grid scenario with changing the variable renewable energy capacity, changing the amount of installed geothermal capacity, of course, the geothermal turndown, and the amount of energy storage installed. So this is just an example from that report. This is written by the California Energy Commission, the California Public Utilities Commission, and the California Energy Resources Board. And this study scenario down here just shows what the capacity is, the capacities of resources are going to be to meet SB 100 by 2045. So as mentioned before, we are using geothermal turndown as the main parameter for defining geothermal flexibility. We're simulating no turndown up to full turndown allowed in increments of 10% of nominal capacity. This grid simulation that we're going to be using is hourly resolved. Now, geothermal power plants are more than capable of ramping to their full power or, or ramping down from their full power in less than an hour. So since this is hourly resolved, we're, going to, we're not going to look at the constraint of ramp rates specifically because we're saying that 100% of the power can be ramped over one hour. So we're really focusing on turndown. As far as operation or dispatch priority, geothermal will run steadily, but it will turn down to the extent possible when there's excess wind and solar generation. And we get all of our cost inputs from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's annual technology baseline 2020, um, in this case, using the mid case. A grid simulation is conducted by a model called the Holistic Grid Resource Integration or High Grid um, Electric Dispatch Model. This is just a sample output of hybrid with some flexible geothermal involved. You have some curtailed wind and solar. You see the geothermal power plants turning down, but they ramp up and turn down depending on when there's curtailment. Then you have other things like energy storage and other resources dispatching to meet the load. Now, the hybrid model has been used for quite a few other studies looking at how the grid responds to radical changes in technology and effects of climate change. But for the purposes of this study, the main outputs of high grid we're going to be using are the system and resource specific levelized cost of electricity and the zero carbon penetration, just to make sure the scenarios we look at comply with the SV100 goal. So let's look at the results for the effect of increasing geothermal flexibility on system wide levelized cost of electricity. Now, this is the system wide levelized cost of electricity all in cost of generation. And what we have here on the y-axis is the system wide levelized cost of electricity. On the x-axis, we have the geothermal turndown range from 0 to 100%. And each of these lines represents a case of different sensitivities to the installed variable renewable energy capacity. What we see is as geothermal is allowed to be more flexible, the system wide cost of electricity goes down. On a normalized basis, it goes down by about 3.5% compared to the case with no turndown allowed. And this largely has to do with reducing the costs associated with curtailment and the integration of wind and solar. And since wind and solar make up a bulk of the electricity system, um, reducing the specific costs of wind and solar has a major benefit for the whole system. Now, what does this mean for geothermal power plant operators? It does mean that their capacity factor goes down from about 90% in the case where no turndown is allowed. Now, note that's not 100% because these power plants still need scheduled operation and maintenance, so on and so forth. But for the most part, it drops from about 90% to about you know, 45 to 47%. It almost gets cut in half when you have five gigawatts of geothermal installed. 
So to provide flexibility operation, geothermal capacity factors decrease, that reduces geothermal power plant revenues. And if they're not compensated for providing flexibility services, and if they have to roll that into their energy price, their energy price almost doubles. It doesn't quite double, but it goes from about 76 up to about 130 in the case with five gigawatts of geothermal. Now, what we're gonna look at next is we're gonna look at the same sets of results, but for increasing capacities of geothermal resources installed in the state. With the next one being, let's say we double our geothermal capacity to 10 gigawatts. What you see is that the trends with regards to increasing geothermal flexibility are for the most part the same. As geothermal is allowed to operate more flexibly, your system-wide levelized cost of electricity goes down. Now, since geothermal is a larger part of the system now, the on a normalized basis, compared to the case where geothermal is not operating flexibly, system-wide LCOE goes down by about 7%, right? So that's about double the normalized benefit compared to when there's five gigawatts. And that's just because when the geothermal capacity is larger, flexible geothermal, flexible operation of geothermal has a larger impact on overall LCOE. In terms of what that means for geothermal power plant owners and operators, similar trends, they will have to increase their price, but the capacity factor when you have more geothermal installed doesn't drop as much. It drops from 90 to about 50, right? And the price of geothermal, if they are not compensated for providing flexibility services, goes from 76 up to you know, about 120, 125. So when there's more geothermal in the system, percentage-wise, they don't have to turn down as much as, as compared to when there's less geothermal in the system. Now we're going to look at the same thing, but for 17 gigawatts of installed geothermal, which is the conventional geothermal technical potential specified by USGS for the state of California. And you get a similar trend, compare, similar trend to what was shown for the five gigawatt and 10 gigawatt geothermal cases, but the percentage reduction is even larger, right? So as geothermal is allowed to operate more flexibly, your system-wide levelized cost of electricity goes down. And on a normalized basis, this can be up to 11.5%. So this continues the trend that we saw earlier when going from five gigawatts to 10 gigawatts. And as far as what that means for geothermal power plant operators, um, similar trends, their capacity factor drops, but then again, not as much as compared to when there's less geothermal capacity and prices or the levelized cost of electricity, which is the break-even price for the most part for these geothermal power plants goes from about $76 per megawatt hour up to about, you know, between 110 and 120 for the most part. So this is a continuation of trends um, shown before and also can use the trend that we saw when going from five gigawatts of geothermal to 10 gigawatts of geothermal. So to wrap up with just some observations and a summary, we find that enabling geothermal power plants to turn down to larger ranges to better accommodate wind and solar resources does reduce the system-wide levelized cost of electricity associated with meeting a given zero carbon penetration target. We also find that with higher geothermal capacities being installed in the system, the effect and therefore the importance of enabling this increasingly flexible operation is more pronounced. So the more geothermal you have in the system, the more important it is for those systems to be able to operate flexibly. Now to provide flexible operation, unsurprisingly geothermal power plants will suffer reduced capacity factors to provide these services. And if the owners and operators of these power plants are not compensated directly for providing these services, and if they have to roll this cost or roll this reduction in revenue into their energy price, then the, the selling price of geothermal electricity would need to increase. So that means that there is a system-wide benefit for flexible geothermal, but if you actually want geothermal power plant operators to provide this type of service, they need to be compensated ideally from a source other than something that rolls into their energy prices. So with that, we are at just about 15 minutes. Uh, we gratefully thank the U.S. Department of Energy Geothermal Technologies Office for providing funding for this project under the subcontract uh, sub 2021-10547. 
And my contact information is here on the slide. If you're watching this by video, you can pause it. Um, you can send me an email and we can chat. As I said, this project is ongoing, so these results are not finalized. There's a few more interesting things that we're going to do. And if you want to stay up to date on what we're doing, send me an email. Thank you so much.